Hello, good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer on Friday the 1st of October at St Mary's Halesworth. We're going to be commemorating Anthony Cooper. I shall read something from the Kindle edition of Celebrating the Saints in a moment. We're coming to you from St Mary's Halesworth. We're live streaming on the Blythe Valley and Cluster Facebook page. Details are there and on our website for the Zoom meeting if you'd like to join us there. And I'm here most days, 8 and 6, so you can actually join me in person if you would like. I'm also going to upload the audio of this onto YouTube uh, when I get back. So welcome, however it is that you are joining us. The words are available at the Church of England's website or in their book, Common Worship Daily Prayer, towards the beginning after prayer during the day, Evening prayer on Friday is in the morning and evening prayer during ordinary time section. One can also download apps for Apple or Android devices, such as the one I'm using now that I have uh, paid a small subscription for, which means I can use it offline, although we do have Wi-Fi here. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. A song of entreaty. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and in your faithfulness give ear to my supplications. Answer me in your righteousness. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for in your sight shall no one living be justified. My spirit faints within me. My heart within me is desolate. I stretch out my hands to you. My soul gasps for you like a thirsty land. O Lord, make haste to answer me. My spirit fails me. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear of your loving kindness in the morning, for in you I put my trust. Show me the way I should walk in, for I lift up my soul to you. Teach me to do what pleases you, for you are my God. Let your kindly spirit lead me on a level path. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake, bring me out of trouble. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. That this, evening prayer sh- that this evening may be holy, good, and peaceful, let us pray with one heart and mind. As our evening prayer rises before you, O God, so may your mercy come down upon us to cleanse our hearts and set us free to sing your praise now and forever. Amen. (coughs) The Psalms are at the back of the book, or we scroll on. The Psalm appointed is 69. I'll read straight through. Do join in with the refrains, or the glory be, and the glory be. If you'd like to, you may read Zor, or the even-numbered verses, uh, to pretend we are doing it antiphonally. And if you want to, we'll pause briefly so that you may use the prayer that follows in silence. Psalm 69. Hide not your face from your servant, O Lord. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up even to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I have grown weary with crying. My throat is raw. My eyes have failed from looking so long for my God. Those who hate me without any cause are more than the hairs of my head. Those who would destroy me are mighty. My enemies accuse me falsely. Must I now give back what I never stole? O God, you know my foolishness, and my faults are not hidden from you. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me, Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be disgraced because of me, O God of Israel. For your sake have I suffered reproach. 
Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my kindred, an alien to my mother's children. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. The scorn of those who scorn you has fallen upon me. I humbled myself with fasting, but that was turned to my reproach. I put on sackcloth also, and became a byword among them. Those who sit at the gate murmur against me, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, I make my prayer to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God. Answer me, O God, in the abundance of your mercy, and with your sure salvation. <clears throat> Draw me out of the mire that I sink not. Let me be rescued from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood drown me, neither the deep swallow me up. Let not the pit shut its mouth upon me. Answer me, Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me in the multitude of your mercies. Hide not your face from your servant. Be swift to answer me, for I am in trouble. Draw near to my soul and redeem me. Deliver me because of my enemies. You know my reproach, my shame and my dishonour. My adversaries are all in your sight. Reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness. I looked for some to have pity, but there was no one. Neither found I any to comfort me. They gave me gall to eat, and when I was thirsty they gave me vinegar to drink. Let the table before them be a trap, and their sacred feasts a snare. Let their eyes be darkened that they cannot see, and give them continual trembling in their loins. Pour out your indignation upon them, and let the heat of your anger overtake them. Let their camp be desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in their tents. For they persecute the one whom you have stricken, and increase the sorrows of him whom you have pierced. Lay to their charge guilt upon guilt, and let them not receive your vindication. Let them be wiped out of the book of the living, and not be written among the righteous. As for me, I am poor and in misery. Your saving help, O God, will lift me up. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will proclaim his greatness with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an offering of oxen, more than bulls with horns and hooves. The humble shall see and be glad. You who seek God, your heart shall live. For the Lord listens to the needy, and his own who are imprisoned he does not, does not despise. Let the heavens and the earth praise him, the seas and all that moves in them. For God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah. They shall live there and have it in possession. The children of his servants shall inherit it, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Hide not your face from your servant, O Lord. So we scroll past our first reading to the Song of the Justified, which we will read as we did the psalm. Our hope is not in vain because God's love has been poured into our hearts. God reckons as righteous those who believe, who believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead. For Christ was handed over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Christ we have gained access to the grace in which we stand and rejoice in our hope of the glory of God. We even exult in our sufferings, for suffering produces endurance, and endurance brings hope, and our hope is not in vain. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us, God proves his love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by his death, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? Therefore we exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have now received our reconciliation. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Our hope is not in vain, because God's love has been poured into our hearts. So to Second Kings, our first reading in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the history section, Amongst Samuel and Chronicles, this is the second book of Kings, beginning at the first verse in the second chapter. So the chapters are the large numbers at the heads of the paragraph, 
the small numbers within the text are the verses. 2 Kings 2, 1 to 18. Online we scroll back a little from the canticle we have just read. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. <clears throat> then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended into whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha went over. When the company of prophets who were at Jericho saw him at a distance, they declared, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. They said to him, See, now we have fifty strong men among your servants. Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the spirit of the Lord has caught him up and thrown him down on some mountain or into some valley. He responded, No, do not send them. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, he said, Send them. So they sent fifty men who searched for three days but, it, but did not find him. When they came back to him, he remained at Jericho. He said to them, Did I not say to you, Do not go? <clears throat> and the story of the parting of Elijah, typical of an oral tradition, this repeated a little bit like the um, three little pigs and the wolf. I will huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. Here we have this repeated. As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. And uh, each of these places uh, has their own significance. Bethel, Jericho, and uh, the Jordan. It's sort of going back to the wilderness. God's people crossed the Jordan and then took Jericho and then Bethel, which is where God was worshipped. Arguably, they are different uh, levels of uh, engagement with God, baptism in water, the spirit, and an initial repentance. And Elijah follows Elijah through that entire journey after having been called. And then he receives, after asking for it, a double portion of the spirit. And uh, we have the chariots of fire taking Elisha. There aren't very many people in the Hebrew Scriptures who don't die. Enoch was one, Elijah was another, which sets him up to return. And at the time of Jesus, the question was, is Jesus Elijah or the Messiah? Is John the Baptist Messiah or Elijah? And as he reads the Gospels, you will see that there's that discussion taking place, written as we have it in the Second Covenant, by those who believe on Jesus as being Messiah. So John the Baptist is described as looking like Elijah, for example. 
And we know that Elisha has the same power as Elijah because he returns and strikes the water and it separates and he walks through on dry ground. And just so that we as the reader are assured that Elijah has been taken up to God's presence and hasn't just been uh, thrown about by a whirlwind, we have this three-day search just like Jesus in the tomb. We are assured that he did rise because the tomb was guarded by temple soldiers such that the body could not possibly have been taken by the disciples who might then have pretended that Jesus had come back to life. So to our second reading, Acts 24, from verse 24 to the 12th verse of the following chapter. Acts is in the second covenant after the Gospels, so if you're following in a book, two-thirds of the way in is where the second covenant begins, or use an index. Again, large number at the head of the paragraph is the chapter number. Small numbers in the text are the verses. Acts chapter 24 and beginning at verse 24. Some days later, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him speak concerning faith in Christ Jesus. And as he discussed justice, self-control and the coming judgment, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present. When I have an opportunity, I will send for you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul, and for that reason, he used to send for him very often and converse with him. After two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, and since he wanted to grant the Jews a favour, Felix left Paul in prison. Three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the leaders of the Jews gave him a report against Paul. They appealed to him and requested as a favour to them against Paul to have him transferred to Jerusalem. They were, in fact, planning an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus replied that Paul was being kept at Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So he said, let those of you who have the authority come down with me, and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them accuse him. After he had stayed among them for not more than eight or ten days, he went down to Caesarea. The next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. When he arrived, the Jews who had gone down from Jerusalem surrounded him, bringing many serious charges against him which they could not prove. Paul said in his defence, I have in no way committed an offence against the law of the Jews, or against the temple, or against the emperor. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favour, asked Paul, Do you wish to go to, up to Jerusalem and be tried there before me on these charges? Paul said, I am appealing to the emperor's tribunal. This is where I should be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as you very well know. Now, if I am in the wrong and have committed something for which I deserve to die, I am not trying to escape death. But if there is nothing to their charges against me, no one can turn me over to them. I appeal to the emperor. Then Festus, after he had conferred with his counsel, replied, You have appealed to the emperor. To the emperor you shall go. <clears throat> and so the scene is set for Paul to go to Rome. Interesting how Felix, this uh, previous long-standing um, Roman official, understands enough about the Jewish faith, the Jewish way, and uh, the Nazarite variant or sect, that he was interested to listen and hear and speak. And clearly he was talking about very broad issues. This wasn't simply Paul saying, um, you're a sinner, you have to recognise that and to ask God for salvation. And when you do confess Jesus as Lord, he will baptise you and you will be saved. The issues of importance for Felix as a governor and for Paul as a Jewish background Christian believer, talking about justice, self-control and the coming judgment. Very interesting set of three themes. Maybe the good basis for an Advent or Lent reflection series. But Festus finds Paul in prison when he succeeds Felix, goes up to Jerusalem as, a, I guess, his tour of getting to know the place. And those are antagonistic Jews there, tell him about Paul. He invites them to come and make their case against Paul in Caesarea, which they do. Festus finds no charge, a little bit like an echo, that is, a little bit like the charges brought against Jesus. But Paul... Um, appeals to the emperor, and so Festus decides to send him. <clears throat> Those antagonistic Jews that sought Paul's death 
are unsuccessful on this occasion. If we put our trust in God, even though things might be difficult, whether it's a legal process, whether it's getting out of an abusive relationship, whether it's trying to care for families that are struggling, whether we've got sickness in our own bodies or in those we love, may we stick with it as Paul did and uh, speak well of God and believe on God and justice will prevail. Let us turn to the responsory back in evening prayer on a Friday during ordinary time. Forsake me not, O Lord, be not far from me, O my God. Forsake me not, O Lord, be not far from me, O my God. Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation, be not far from me, O my God. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Forsake me not, O Lord, be not far from me, O my God. And so to the song of Mary, we'll read it straight through. You have scattered the proud in their conceit, and lifted up the lowly. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. He has looked with favour on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him, from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, and has scattered the proud in their conceit, casting down the mighty from their thrones, and lifting up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, to remember his promise of mercy, the promise made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children for ever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. You have scattered the proud in their conceit, and lifted up the lowly. Let us pray. Saviour, sacrifice, seal, one in three, three in one. As we come to the conclusion of this day and darkness gathers, we thank you that you are our light and that you have called us to be light in the dark places in our world. We pray that your light will shine in the dark places of our lives, in our hearts, in our thoughts, that we may be windows to that which is good, that we will think on that which is true, just, right, honourable, and that our thoughts and our words will affect for the good of our families and communities, that your rule, your authority, your sovereignty, your majesty, will be manifest, will be assured in our place, in our time, that that great transaction you wrought for us on the cross, exchanging brokenness for wholeness, Impotence for power, isolation for belonging. We pray that you will assure us and establish us in that, and our communities and our families. The Release International Prayer Feed invites us to pray for Christians in Kurdistan who have lived in displacement camps for years. We pray that God will open a way for them to resettle in safety and rebuild their lives. I'm assuming that Christian Aid's prayer diary has not yet been produced, so making use of our local Wi-Fi, I'm turning up the uh, their website. Prayers for Syria. We pray for Christian Aid partners continuing to offer education through the disruption of conflict. We pray that young people participating in the programme are able to feel, fa feel safe enough to learn and use their skills and voices to solve problems in their community. Pray that we will use children, or reuse, we will be open to allowing children to do the same in our community. Communities. And uh, if you'll give me a moment, I will see if I can open our diocesan Prayer diary. As I haven't yet set that up. No, it's not yet available. 
we pray for our bishops, uh, Martin and Mike, and the archdeacons that serve with them. I'm not going to continue looking through the website to find the various names. We thank you too for our archdeacons and our rural deans across the diocese. We pray they will be encouraged and blessed as they see the power you won for us evidenced in the lives of those they work amongst. We pray God's blessing on the streets and villages in which we live. Today praying for the St Michael group, the streets in Cookley, Linstead Road, Cookley Street and Mary's Lane, in Heveningham, Low Road, Clay Hill, Barrels Hill, Heveningham Road, Church Road, Halesworth Road, Heveningham Long Road and the street and in Huntingfield, Brickkiln Lane, Barrels Hill, The Street, Laundry Lane, Bridge Street, Linstead Road, and Cratfield Road. And having just re-entered St Mary Walpole into my sheet here, I haven't yet put the street names in, but we pray for those uh, streets also. The people that live there, that have faith, may they be encouraged and enabled to be salt and light, being healing, valued, compelling in their communities. We pray for those that do not yet believe, as they, with those who do, have good and bad experiences in their lives. We pray that that will build them into fuller, more fulfilled, more fruitful, more resilient people. And if faith is a part of that, so much the better. We pray for the businesses based in or serving these addresses too. May they thrive and prosper. And those who have the authority to make decisions, may they do so wisely, that they may continue to contribute goods, jobs and services to the local economy. And as we consider those who are sick with coronavirus, whether they have just received a positive test, whether they have died, those who are dying, those with long COVID, those being treated and expecting a full recovery. We ask that all interventions will be successful and that they and those that love them will know your presence. Just as you were isolated, please grant them a sense of belonging and your presence, that they will not feel that isolation that you did, that you will see them through this, their la what that, this which will be for some their last journey and for others a life-changing experience. We pray your blessings on Peter, Margaret, Anne, Roger, Frankie, Jane, Ron, Jim, Anthony, Betty, Beryl, Maggie, Pauline, Nicholas, Jill, Mary, Rosie, Barbara, Jean, Valerie, Paul, Sarah, Dennis and Kay, Linda, Di, Francis, Olive, David, Mike, Jilly, Jean, Paddy and Doreen. We pray that you will intervene in each of these cases, whether they need money, whether they need to get into or out of a relationship, into or out of work, whether they need a physical healing or a mental one. We pray that you will intervene and that, that the power of your sacrifice may be made known in their circumstance and that they will have a story to tell. We thank you too for all that was good in the lives of Seralina, Raymond, Roger, Alison, Audrey, Frederick, Felicity, Herta, Mac, Jean, Bert and Neville cremated today. We remember those we know and love and see no longer, all whose ears mind falls at this time, and those that have served you faithfully in this place. We think too of those who have died suddenly and unprepared through sickness, violence, neglect, accident, and those that have taken their own lives. Rest eternal, grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. We pray for ourselves and all who mourn, that you will be for us the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Before I pray in tongues for a minute, I'm reminded, as I'm flicking through my apps on my tablet, I didn't read this reading from the Kindle edition of Celebrating the Saints about the life of Anthony Cooper, written by Margaret Cropper. Anthony Ashley Cooper was born in 1801 and his life spanned nearly the entire century. He entered Parliament in 1826 as Conservative member for Woodstock, but his first sessions were marked by a sort of independence which was to become characteristic. He chose to make his first speech in support of a bill to amend the law for the regulation and improvement of lunatic asylums. This was a work that he had never, he was never to lay down, and it involved him in his first hand-to-hand -hand struggle against inhuman behaviour. In 1834, he became chairman of the Parliamentary Commissioners overseeing the reform, a post that he kept until his death. 
The work involved visiting asylums, and when, thirty years later, he gave an account of those early days, every horrid detail was still clear in his mind. When we began our visitations, he writes, one of the first rooms that we went into contained nearly a hundred and fifty patients in every form of madness, a large proportion of them chained to the wall. The noise and din were such that we positively could not hear each other speak. I never beheld anything so horrible and so miserable. Something of the misery of his childhood had left him with an inferiority complex which always haunted him, but also gave him a passion for justice. When the Napoleonic War ended, there was a new set of circumstances to be reckoned with in England, and a lack of courage, a sense of fatalism. Also a strange new god had crept into the reckoning of society, the god of economic necessity. In a speech he declared that he had read of those who had sacrificed their children to Moloch, but they were a merciful people compared with Englishmen in the 19th century. There were two sets of child workers whom he particularly tried to help during his parliamentary life, the children working in the mines and the boys who swept the chimneys of England. In 1842 he succeeded in getting a bill passed ensuring that all women and children and apprentices were taken out of the mines. Throughout his life, undergirding all his education and social endeavours, was a strong evangelical Christian faith. As a young man, he had recorded in his diary some considerations that were to guide him throughout his life. He wrote, Now let me consider a while my future career. The first principle, God's honour. The second, man's happiness. The means, prayer and unremitting diligence. All petty love of excellence must be put aside. The matter must be studied and one's best done for the remainder. Near the end of his life, when he had succeeded to the title of Earl of Shaftesbury, he summed up his views to his biographer. My religious views are not, are not popular, but they are the views that have sustained and comforted me all my life. They have never been disguised, nor have I ever sought to disguise them. I think a person's religion, if it is worth anything, should enter into every sphere of life and rule their conduct in every relation. I have always been, and please God, always shall be an evangelical of the evangelicals, and no biography can represent me. That does not fully and emphatically represent my religious views. Shaftesbury wanted to reform the church as much as the Tractarians did. What he wanted was a practical, courageous church concerned with people's lives. Probably much of his thinking was governed by the fact that he had found the clergy as a body not interested in his work for shorter hours and better conditions. There were some who he knew did care, but he felt that the majority of the clergy were losing their chances of getting into close touch with the working class. He wanted more power for the laity and less for the bishops and clergy. His biography by the Hammonds concludes thus. The devil, with sad and sober sense on his grey face, tells the rulers of the world that the misery which disfigures the life of great societies is beyond the reach of human remedy. A voice is raised from time to time in answer, a challenge in the name of the mercy of God, or the justice of nature, or human dignity. Shaftesbury was such a voice. To the law of indifference and the drift taught by philosophers and accepted by politicians, he opposed the simple revelation of his Christian conscience. When silence falls on such a voice, some everlasting echo still haunts the world to break its sleep of habit or despair. May Anthony pray for us as we follow in his footsteps. the Friday evening prayer from the book Heal us, O God, from all our afflictions and keep us steadfast in your love. Bind up our wounds, raise us from death and lead us to fullness of life through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Goodbye to those joining us on YouTube.